And uh, I quite frankly, I'm a little in the dark about, I mean, I, I talk to friends who are in, in the North, but I don't know what's going on overall with the kibbutz scene there. So, and one of the speakers was actually in the kibbutz, uh, Nirim on October 7th. So she's gonna be speaking a little bit about it and she's originally from the United States. So, yeah. and she's roughly the age of some of our congregants in the sense that she's, um, you know, she speaks to us kind of as a person who, uh, what if we had been there on October 7th, I think is a, what I'm kind of getting at. Um, so with you going yeah. to Utah this weekend, are you not yeah. going to be at services Friday night? No, I won't be. Ooh, I won't be there. Uh, Wendy will be there. Um, and um, yeah. But uh, we had a nice beach hub doll at the beginning of the week and Shabbat, it will, I'm sure, be very nice. And then the following Friday, as uh, I already mentioned, we have a, a extra Shabbat that we're doing live in person with Rick and Addy on the 27th to get us kind of in the mood for Shabbat. So that's the, the 27th. But um, hopefully you're all getting uh, the much nicer looking uh, e-blast now that Rick is now in charge of Rick, of Rick and Addy. Uh, and so hopefully you're getting you know, those updates. And we're getting it on time, on. Sunday morning. What? We're getting it early on Sunday yeah. morning, too. <clears throat> yeah, well, he's he's very efficient. So it's great. I mean, he's he's doing a great job. It looks good, and he's he's coordinating it all. And, of course, he knows he knows what it is, and he's involved in some of it. So it's – it's uh, and he does that for a living, by the way. He's not, like, doing it because he just said, hey, I'll help out. He does that for several congregations and – um. Yeah, so he's good at it. That's why I asked him because I knew he'd be good at it. But um, yeah, he's doing a good job. So <clears throat> we're reading um, today the in the nineties. We're going to be in the nineties today of Psalms, and I have to I have to be honest. I know these Psalms a lot better than I know the other Psalms because these are the Psalms of Shabbat. Now, like the Ashrei is a Psalm that traditionally we do every day, so. And that's 145. So that psalm, like that psalm I know by heart. But this these psalms uh are ones that are done very frequently. I mean, there's a lot of psalms that, quite frankly, I don't see unless we're doing a class. I mean, honestly, there's psalms that just they're not used a lot. They're not, you know, now I point out the ones or the lines that we know that are in the the prayers, right? The liturgy, uh, the ones that we see, but there's a lot of psalms that like I don't read the, the whole psalms every day. Uh, and th there are psalms I don't see, but these psalms I do. Uh, not this one, not Psalm 91, but um, the next ones. And I'll explain that a little bit about what Kabbalah Shabbat uh, was or, or originally, traditionally was. And uh, yeah, let's take a look at the psalms um, that make up a, a, a traditionally, and again, this goes back thousands of years because the Talmud talks about these psalms uh, for Shabbat. Uh, what, what, how we kind of built up a Shabbat liturgy around the psalms. But Psalm ninety-one is not part of that. We we um, uh, we actually started a new section of the third book of Psalms last week. We we kind of made the transition. We, you know, we finished one book and with the kind of a little prayer that comes at the end of the psalm, and then we moved into uh, this section. But um, uh, but th there's nothing in this like there's nothing in the '90s that says that says, "Hey, you're just you're about to enter the psalms that we do on Shabbat." That was done at a later time by the rabbis, at a time when the psalms were already kind of organized. Did the rabbis have um, were the rabbinic figures involved in editing and kind of giving us the psalms? Absolutely. But there was already a tradition before that on the organization of the Psalms. And so they didn't say, okay, now we're coming into the Psalms that are the Psalms of Shabbat or the Psalms of, of Ascents, the, the, the Psalms the, we call the Shir Hamalot. There's nothing that says that you're entering in those. And that is not the way the books were, that was not the way the books were, the, the books were organized. So let's take a look at this one, uh, Psalm 91 first. And we've got Judith, who's going to be reading um, uh, for us. And um, 
let's take a look at Psalm 91. O oh, you who dwell in the shelter of the Most High and abide in the protection of Shaddai, I say of the Lord, my refuge and stronghold, my God in whom I trust, that he will save you from the fowler's trap, from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his pinions. You will find refuge under his wings. His fidelity is an encircling shield. You need not fear the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks in the darkness or the scourge that ravages at noon. A thousand may fall at your left side, 10,000 at your right, but it shall not reach you. You will see it with your eyes. You will witness the punishment of the wicked because you took the Lord, my refuge and most high as your haven. No harm will befall you, no disease touch your tent. For he will order his angels to guard you wherever you go. They will carry you in their hands, lest you hurt your foot on a stone. You will tread on cubs and vipers. You will trample lions and asps. Because he is devoted to me, I will deliver him. I will keep him safe, for he knows my name. When he calls on me, I will answer him. I will be with him in distress. I will rescue him and make him honored. I will let him live to a ripe old age and show him my salvation. Wow. So the last three lines are clearly lines that are said that God is saying. Those are, those are in God's voice. But um, this psalm, you can see, is really one of protection, right? It's a... It is uh, a psalm. Well, what would you think about this psalm if you, if you looked at this psalm, folks? What would you say about this psalm? I mean, we've seen other psalms that are psalms of protection, but what would you say about this psalm? It's also, by the way, used on Jewish hall. I mean, it's used on the Shabbat morning prayers. It's Pesukei de Zimra, and and obviously this line about the angels uh, will guard you wherever you go is kind of like what we say on Shabbat for the Shalom Aleichem prayer, right? The, the angels will guide you or protect you, will be with you as you go there. But look at this kind of, let's look at this kind of stuff here. Um, went too little too far. Uh, um, you need not fear the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day. A thousand may fall at your left side, ten thousand at your right, but it shall not reach you. What do you think about that song? Anybody? No. Anybody sees anything in that it's song? Very, that looks... it's, it's very war related, obviously. Uh, what do you say? Why do you say obviously, Judith? Why? Because you're talking about arrows. Absolutely. <laughs> and Judith is a hundred percent right. This psalm is sometimes called the soldier psalm. So this song, my friends, in popular culture, you can see it right here. Sometimes called the soldier's prayer. Prayer. Camouflage bandanas imprinted with the psalm are often distributed to US troops. Check that out. Here's a little stat. Hey, it's not even a Jewish thing. It's I mean, it's a it's a thing for any soldier. Now think about that. This is the largest military force or the, let's say the largest, I guess the People's Army of China is the largest military force, but the most, I would say, in some ways, respected, right? And most, most world rankings put us up there at the top. The top army and an army that's been used, obviously, in some cases, not for things that we're as proud of, but definitely something that we're very proud of that, you know, we've protected countries around the world and that uh, our country is still the one that is the, country most dedicated to protecting freedom and democracy around the world. It's a, it's a fact. I mean, you can, I don't want to get sentimental today on constitution day, but I will tell you that um, it's a pretty powerful thing, my friends, when you think about the fact that the army of the United States um, carries with this and oftentimes gives their soldier, our soldiers, this prayer to hold while they're in battle. Thousands of years later. So we talk about the power of Psalms when we talk about 
the Bible and uh, the Torah in particular. And again, you know, look, everybody goes, well, there's Old Testament, New Testament, whatever. I will tell you that the fact that these are the lines that are given to people when they go uh, around the world into combat on our behalf, that's pretty powerful. I think so. So you can see it's also been used in music. Uh, different bands have used it uh, in, uh, <laughs> in, in popular rock bands. <laughs> Jerry Garcia band uh, did it. Madonna used it. You can see uh, Sinead O'Connor used it. Um, so you can see that it's popular, popular for other things too. Um, so this psalm is really one of, of uh, protection we've seen, but it definitely feels like, I, I mean, this is, this is a psalm. It doesn't really, it doesn't, it, like some of the psalms start off with, you know, things were really bad, but you'll fix them. This one like starts off right away. You know, you're, this is a, God, you protect us. You protect us from harm. You protect us from danger. You protect us in battle. You protect us even when everything around us is going to hell. So, yeah, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can. So again, for There's some different, yeah, and there's and there's definitely stuff in this psalm though that people looked at and said, yeah, but this psalm speaks particularly about war. It 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 seems to be particularly about, again, yeah, and because it, the, yeah, there's a but there's a sense that I can go into battle and and. You know, people can be falling all around me, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to go down. Um, I mean, that's what that line. That's that's what that line. A thousand may fall at your left side, ten thousand at your right. Walk that yeah, Psalm twenty three. Yeah, but 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 yeah. So Psalm twenty. John's saying that Psalm twenty three was used because, and it's used because. When I, you know, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even in that, even in the darkest places, so yeah, people do that, and they and they say that because it is so well known, right? It's so well known from funerals and from from scary times, right, or sad times. But it's it's not particularly well. It's not specifically about war. It's not specifically about about as this, you know, as this is kind of talking about you know, a combat experience where, you know, you're like running on the, the beaches of Normandy for your life and, you know, people are dying all around you. This is, this is the, the imagery that's used here. This is much more vivid and much more descriptive than I'm in the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Cause, cause quite frankly, as we've seen in a lot of the Psalms, the Valley of the Shadow of Death, which what does that even mean, right? But we said, you know, that could also be, I feel like I'm in a, in a scary place. The, the, the shadow of death, Tzal Mavet, means that it's not death, it's the shadow of death, the specter of death, the fear of death. That could happen to you when you're lying in your bed, right? That can happen anytime. Well, no, I, I listen, I know, but this one's scary. What? Yeah. 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 You will. Well, yeah, I understand, but you you just said that Psalm twenty. You said that Psalm twenty three is used, and I'd say, yeah, I get it. It's used because people know it, but this Psalm definitely has a feeling of of protection. So, so John raises an interesting question. There's two lines in this that talk about it. Why? And again, well, I mean, you could say the other. There's other things that happen here. Uh, no, no harm will befall you. No disease will touch your tent. Which, again, in battle, you're definitely in tents more. But back then, that was your home too. That's another word for your home. You know, sending angels to guard you wherever you go, right? Uh, but also this this line about cubs, vi cubs and vipers, lions and asps. You know, that's clearly about animals, but for people who felt like, 
well, first of all, some combat experiences put people into areas where there were animals too. I mean, you know, go to, you know, you talk about being on patrol and, and whether you were in, you know, India during World War II or whether you were in, in uh, Vietnam and in, in, in 60s and 70s, you know, there, there's animals out there when you're out in combat too. But it also could be understood as like, you know, any kinds of, of dangerous things out there that are not necessarily animals, but are also, um, you know, booby traps and, 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 uh, you know, explosive devices, you know, that are now laid out for people, you know, call them like that too. These would be like modern day versions of those things. But, but, um, there is this un understanding here that like, again, it, there are, you're right. There are individual lines, right? But people use those individual lines all the time, right? So, so the rabbis do it in the Talmud. We see how they quote and build up a whole teaching off of one line or one word. But for us, and I guess you know, as you said, you know, Christians have it too. Um, they'll have one line. We'll put one line on a on a on a bandana or on a poster. So, yeah, we we mine the Bible for for lines and in some cases they're just they're just a line you know they're just two words in some cases you know that's a good point we find the bible for a, a line yeah. of or words that serve our purpose yeah and and what why we do it obviously is because we're doing we're we're, we're using a text that when we tell people we you know this comes from the bible that that has the weight the gravitas and the power and the the impression of it. I mean, you know, there's nothing, you can't go to a better source than the Bible. So, you know, we derive uh, that, that strength from there. And again, because the book is worldwide that everybody, you know, every country has it in every language. It's the only book that's been translated into every language. And it's also um, timeless. I mean, it's, it's the only book that we can say has been read, was read 3000 years ago, 2,800 years ago, maybe to be safe. And it will be read 2,800 years from now if there are still people. So it's the only book that we can do that with. And so when we say to somebody in Africa or we say someone today to someone in Asia or wherever we are, we quote a line of the Bible, they, 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 they can reference it. They can know it. So that's one of the reasons why we do it so much. And, and again, you know, look, is it one line or two lines? Yeah, but that's enough. That's enough because it's because it's because it is the Bible. Um, and again, as we mentioned, it, the last three lines are are in the words uh, in the, the 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 parts that are in the quotes here are God. Our God is God speaking. Fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. Um, which again, Orech uh, Yamim. I will I will allow him to um, live a long time. Uh, that's considered to be a blessing, right? But it's also uh, the words orech yamim. We, uh, we, we translate that sometimes as a long time or many, many days, many, many days. But to go back to Psalm 23, that's the way Psalm 23 ends. When we say, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, it's actually the words orech yamim for many long days. So, when we say it at a funeral, the implication is, is that this is, I'm going to be in heaven with God, but the lines really are very similar to the lines that we see throughout Psalms, which are, we're going to live a long time in this world. Um, but again, it's also connected with salvation. It's connected with being saved by God. Is it literally physically being saved or is it, or is it being saved forever? So translations are translations, right? They 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 have a they have a agenda. So Mary, how does it translate at the end of Psalm ninety one? I will let him live. Yeah. So there, interestingly, it doesn't say, "and he shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever" instead of for many long days. Again. If we translated Psalm 23 the way it's written, and we said that at every funeral, people would not be happy. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long days. People, 
I mean, that's it's the same words. Oraf yamim. Or the, what I'm saying is that's the end of the Psalm 23. That's the same phrase. Uh, I I know glory's on glory. How does your how does your Bible translate verse 16? I'm sure it translates as many long day or long I, time. I couldn't hear Mary. Uh, it's kind of weird because mine looks almost like a question, but it doesn't have a question mark at the end. Oh. It says, uh, with long life, will I satisf satisfy him and show him my salvation? Yeah. Again, that's the way most Bibles are going to translate or yamin, except on Psalm 23. <laughs> except on long. By the way, Glory, if you look on your look on your Bible right now, real quick, just look at the last line of Psalm 23. How does it translate the words or Just look second. at the very, very end. I and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long years, for many long days, or Psalm 23. Uh, um do you want me to read the whole verse or just that line? Yeah, just the last line. Okay, uh, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah. Because that's the translation of it. That's what it... Can't, can't do it. You can't do it. As people will lose their minds if you do that. What? He changed the words. I can imagine some of you. He just changed the words of the song. For many long days, actually, is what it is. Yamim are days. I mean, sometimes yamim will be translated poetically as years. The King James, folks. Where do we come up from? That King James. They didn't change the. They changed the implication because, because. Sixteen early sixteen hundreds, late fifteen hundreds, early sixteen hundreds. 1590 or something like that, 1593. I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> no, it's not, it's, it's a, it's an understanding of the psalm that I don't even know, honestly, John, I don't know how long ago people started reading Psalm 23 as a psalm of protection in times of death. But once it became, became that, I don't think, by the way, I, I haven't, I don't know if there's a way to go back and and find like the demarcation point, but Jews really didn't use it. We didn't probably 200 years ago. Psalm 23 was not said at funerals on Jewish funerals. It's done at Jewish funerals because it's done at Christian funerals. But I mean, like it's done at almost every Jewish funeral. I I do it mostly. I do it usually. I don't. I don't do it all the time, but I do it a lot because people expect it. But I, I don't. It's it's not my favorite psalm. It's not my. It's not. It's definitely not a psalm that I think is. I, we do it. You know, use John's point. There's one line. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. When I when it says I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, it's clearly talking about the temple in Jerusalem. I will dwell in the house of the Lord for many many years, many days, for a very long time. I mean. Listen, if you really want to know the, the way it should be translated is for a very long time. That's the way it should be translated. Nobody would like that translation today. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for a very long time. And this is, I will give him many days as a, as a, as a I will satisfy him with many days, many with, with, a, with a long, with a long life. I, to take, to, to carry the, the translation is similar, you know, the, I will I will satisfy him with many days and I will let him see salvation. I will I will enable him to see salvation. I mean. So that's the translation, the the secret of translation. Um, whether you're going to capture the intent or whether you're going to promote your own agenda in it too. Um, the last psalm had no ascription at all. This one does. And it has two words for the song itself, right? Mizmor and a shear, right? You say Mizmor shear. And then it says specifically, Le Yom HaShabbat. Now that is significant because it actually tells us that this is a psalm for Shabbat. So we've seen psalms that say, you know, this is a psalm that David wrote when he was in a certain situation. We've seen this is a 
this is a, well, there's a lot of words we don't know, but when it says this is a psalm for Shabbat, I mean, it's literally telling you when you're supposed to say this psalm. That's unusual. That's not something that we would see. Like it doesn't say, hey, this is a psalm for Sukkot. This is a psalm for, you know, well, it wouldn't say holidays that weren't celebrated as much like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Remember, in the biblical times, it was it was Sukkot, it was Sukkot, Shavuot, and Pesach. Those were the big, those were the big three. But um Priests. Priests got in a circle, whatever, and they said this this one we need to say a song. Every, every Shabbat, yeah. Every Shabbat we're gonna say this psalm, and it's very, very old. Now, again, the ascriptions, the 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 titles to these, again, we don't know how early in the editing process they they these things got on there. But this tells us that our ancestors said this psalm on Shabbat. Again, they decided a long, long time ago that this line is going to be said, as I mean, that this will be said. And then it becomes part of the psalm, right? That's now the first line of the psalm. This is a psalm for Shabbat. Now, when people sing a psalm today, oftentimes they, of course, incorporate the, 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 the first line as part of the psalm. They're going to say that. Not always, not always. And somebody, sometimes like a song, we've played, I've played you enough versions of psalms already that they don't always, they'll, they'll sometimes just have two or three lines in it. But this psalm actually begins with the words, Mizmor Shir Le Yom HaShabbat. And almost every psalm version, I mean, every uh, song version of this psalm that I know incorporates that in there. Because the fact that it's for Shabbat becomes like, that becomes not only the reason why we're singing it all you know, every week, but it becomes like a celebration that that line becomes a celebration of the day. And so it, it in itself becomes an affirmation of how important Shabbat is. So we're going to read it. And I'm going to, before, you know, we move on to the other Psalms, we're going to play some versions of this because of all the Psalms of Shabbat, this Psalm, you know what I'll do? I'll, let, let me, let me show you this first before we read this. Before we read this psalm, I'm going to just share with you a little bit about, um, about what is actually happening on Shabbat. Okay, so let's just pop up this for a quick... Uh, let me just put up um, this little piece right here, just so you can see. Um, What this and and um, this is something I'm going to share with you. Um, this is from a really great website. When you want to just get like an answer for why we do certain things, I would say that this is one of the best for that, which is my Jewish learning. Okay, here we go. So, um, in Jewish homes around the world, candles are lit, blessings are said, and Shabbat is welcome. And in synagogues, the Friday Ma'ariv service begins with a series of hymns, psalms, and blessings, collectively known as Kabbalat Shabbat, welcoming Shabbat. In Orthodox congregations, Kabbalat Shabbat consists of Psalm 95 through 99, Psalm 29, the hymn L'chad Odi, Come the Beloved, and Psalm 92 and 93. A lengthy reading from the Talmud passages concerning uh, Shabbat and, and a mourner's Kaddish and a Kaddish de Rabbanan, the Kaddish for the rabbis, is said after. So it's almost like a mini service. Kabbalat Shabbat in an Orthodox synagogue is like a mini service. Conservative reform and reconstruction of services, the Talmud passages and two versions of the Kaddish may be omitted, often replaced by a half Kaddish that separates the Kabbalat Shabbat from the Mariv service proper. So if you go into an Orthodox synagogue on Shabbat, on Friday night, which, by the way, not usually that well attended, Friday night services are much more a product of reform and conservative and reconstructionists, since it said it, their reconstructionists are not so big in the West Coast, and they're 
not that big nationally either, but very similar to, you know, the, the more um, progressive versions of Judaism. Uh, yeah, we don't usually do the Talmud readings, and we usually don't say the Kaddish separately, the mourner's Kaddish. Um, but yeah, if you come, if you go to an Orthodox synagogue, you'll hear, you'll hear a mourner's Kaddish said at the beginning of, this, of the service, the Kabbalat Shabbat part. But what's interesting is the Kabbalat Shabbat part, and, and, and again, in a lot of Orthodox communities, people just don't go out Friday night. They don't walk to synagogue necessarily Friday night. They'll go s Saturday morning, but they won't necessarily go Friday night, much less a thing. I mean, my, do my dog, my wife grew up in an Orthodox synagogue, and she very rarely went to Friday night. And her father, who went every Saturday morning, they lived in walking distance to their shul. Um, he went every Saturday morning, Never, very rarely, I would say, unless he was saying Kaddish, he very rarely went on a Friday night. Uh, it just isn't, it, it, people don't do it. And when they do, it's the men, it's not the women. Exactly. Very rarely a family thing. You just don't see it. And people are, are kind of like amazed by that because if you grew up in a conservative reform congregation like I did, that was the when we went. We went Friday night. And Saturday morning, we'd go, we had a bar mitzvah, a friend's bar, bar bat mitzvah, you know, we'd go Saturday morning, you know, begrudgingly because it probably meant we weren't going to be, you know, we weren't going to be at home watching cartoons or or, play, or playing outside or doing or whatever. Or playing soccer. Yeah, yeah. So it was tough. But Friday night, you know, we'd even look forward to Friday night sometimes. You know, you get that punch, and cookies and stuff like that. That was stuff we looked forward to. But um gosh, yeah, when I, when I learned later on in life as I, you know, kind of, started, you know, learning more about traditional Judaism that Friday night was at home with family. And the guy would go to shul with his friends or, or would walk there if they were very traditional and very like observant uh, and wanted to, or say Kaddish or do something, support their friends. But normally they, they, they didn't go. They didn't even go. I'm like, how, how can you be that religious? It just wasn't, wasn't the thing. But Kabbalat Shabbat was something that people really look forward to. And Kabbalat Shabbat goes back about 500 years, the tradition of, of creating this kind of special mini service was really uh, a, a, a outgrowth of the mystic mystical forms of Judaism that were you know primarily based on the Zohar and, and uh, you know Kabbalistic texts. This idea of kind of again and Kabbalah Shabbat even has the word Kabbalah in it. Uh, Kabbalah literally means just to receive, to welcome, to bring in. But but in 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 Judaism, the Kabbalah also kind of is uh, the word also means to receive you know the spirit of something, and so to receive the spirit of Shabbat, um, this was something that became really really important. You can see in the 16th century in the small town of Svat, located in the Galilee, Shlomo Halevi Alkabetz was one of the many mystics who was there, and around 1540, so right around the time that you know. Well, it was a little bit before Shakespeare and those kind of times. Uh, Alkabetz composed this Lachado di to greet Shabbat. And uh, it spread. Even though it was written by uh, Sephardic Jews, it actually spread to the Ashkenazi community. And so we continued to, uh, to do Kabbalat Shabbat. And for us, you know, in the, in the reform tradition, you know, we'll, we'll add um, some of the uh, Psalms and of course, Lachad Odi is our the backbone of our of our Kabbalat Shabbat uh, as well. This is also about some of the other prayers like the Amidah and things that we do on on um, on Shabbat. But really, again, for us, this is uh, th these are traditions of the Psalms in particular that we use. So Psalm ninety two ninety three. Uh, uh, and I would say 92 of all the Psalms on Shabbat is the one that is, uh, is, is really a standout one and one that a lot of congregations do. But you'll see, and we'll point it out as we get to some of the other Psalms in this collection, uh, including the 95 to 99, so that we'll read today too. There are sections of those. Not This Psalm 92, oftentimes, and we're going to hear a version of it or a couple versions of it, some of the many of the versions of Psalm 92 incorporate the entire psalm. It's a beautiful psalm, and let's read it. 
It is good to praise the Lord, to sing hymns to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your steadfast love at daybreak, your faithfulness each night. With a ten-stringed harp, with voice and lyre together, you've gladdened me by your deeds, O Lord. I shout for joy at your handiwork. How great are your works, O Lord, how very subtle your designs. A brutish man cannot know, a fool cannot understand this. Though the wicked sprout like grass, though the evildoers blossom, it is only that they may be destroyed forever. But you are exalted, O Lord, for all time. Surely your enemies, O Lord, surely your enemies perish, all evildoers scattered. You raise my horn high like that of a wild ox. I am soaked in freshening oil. I shall see the defeat of my watchful foes, hear of the downfall of the wicked who beset me. The righteous bloom like a date palm. They thrive like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they still produce fruit. They are full of sap and freshness, attesting that the Lord is upright, my rock in whom there is no wrong. So, Let's take a look at this. The psalm itself is, as John would say, similar to the 91 psalms that precede it, right? But there are a few things in this psalm, and again, some of them are just compilations of other ideas that we've seen in other psalms. But um, it's really the beginning, the first four verses, and the last few verses that people, I think, are really the most familiar with, and the ones that are, are kind of, are kind of uh, focused on the most. Again, like a lot of the Psalms, and I'm not saying this is the only Psalm, but there's definitely references to the, the beauty of the natural world, right? Uh, the line here that we also see several times in, in the Psalms, Ma Galu Ma Sech Adonai, right? How amazing, how immense are your, are your creations, God, right? So, there's a there's this understanding that God's world is just amazing. There's amazing things in it, right? And then the reference to some of the things in particular, right, are are the trees. And so people focus on this line a lot. Sadiq Katamar, right? The righteous bloom like a date palm. They thrive like a cedar in Lebanon. Okay, Eras Balva Uh This is an idea that we look at the trees, we look at how beautiful some of these trees are, and we say, that's the way a righteous person will be with God. And those phrases kind of stick out in our minds because the, the imagery there, the, the way that, the, way that um, the natural world is brought into this is really quite amazing because again in the midst of everything look at just the psalm we just read before the psalm about you know being in war and watching you know people falling all around you i mean there's stuff in here about again enemies are used here right uh enemies here right enemies watchful foes i mean they're here it's not like they're not but there's also this understanding that the world is amazing. It's filled with God's amazing things. There's crazy stuff that's happening. And again, as we read at the very beginning, I take joy in celebrating God and celebrating with musical instruments how beautiful the world is. And so people have looked at these lines, right? They've looked at this very deep outpouring of the heart and energy on behalf of praising God on Shabbat and said, wow, okay, well, this psalm, by the way, if you think about it, if it's a psalm for Shabbat and it says, I'm going to play the Asor, which we translate as a 10-string harp, it definitely has the word Eser in it, and we assume that that's a tens, it says something about ten, it probably is ten strings. And we know that a nevel is a is a lyre. Uh, I mean, uh, um, um, wow, that's interesting. Uh, 
what how does your Mary, how does your translation uh translate it? Yeah, that's weird. They just left out a whole word here in the translation. Well, I never noticed that. It looks like it's their their not novel as as voice. No, that's the that's the Higion. Oh, that's, that's Higion. Higion. Okay. That's Higion. The, the, they just left out a word. Yeah. And so Mary in Mary's translation, it says Aleasor. That's the ten string thing. Ale now. I mean, it's clearly. Yeah, there's clearly four things here, and there's only three things in the translation. So uh, an asor is something, a nevel is something, which they translate as a harp, and a chinor is a is a lyre, lyre. right? That's the the harp or another harp, a handheld harp lyre, which is a, we sometimes translate it in modern Hebrew as a as a as a violin, as a kinor. Um, but that's where the word kineret comes from, the yam kineret. The Galilee is shaped like a lyre. It's shaped like that old harp, which is why it's called the Kinneret. Um, but Chinor is it was like is mentioned a lot in the Bible, and so is the the Navel. They're used a lot. An Asor is not as common, but yeah, I mean the King James actually at least translated these as. They, so the the King James, I don't know if you heard Mary, they called the Navel a Psalter, the Psalter which is, again, another kind of string instrument that was used for psalms, but it's not. It's, it's, a psalm, it's a psalm instrument. It doesn't really describe it. I don't know, Glory, does your translation there have, a, have three instruments in the voice? It should. It says, uh, to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. Oh, that's even less. That's only, I mean, well, it's not it's still the same uh what does yours say yeah well that's the that's the that's the same as this pretty much yeah so asor a nevel alhigion bechinor now what i'm saying is there's two instruments here there's a 10 string instrument and there's a and there's a navel, which however you want to translate a navel, it's another instrument. And higion bechinor is voice and lyre together, because when it says higion bechinor, we know that it's this last thing, the chinor, is a lyre, is a lyre or a harp, some kind of harp. And higion bechinor means like I'm playing it while I'm singing it, right? It's it's accompaniment. That's why it says voice and lyre together. But higion bechinor. So, that it, but it's there's two instruments on the first on the first on the first clause. Before the comma, there should be two instruments. It, it's not a big deal. I just, I just never noticed it. Is it, is it uh, ever translated as "voice of the lyre"? Well, it's a good question. I don't know, but but the word, the letter bechinor, al higia, because look, it says all, all, on, all. On. So there's three, but the last phrase. I mean, I like. Uh, with with i mean if you want to give a very unpoetic translation and the liar with vocal accompaniment that's what that's what it literally means but yes i know what you're saying judith could it be the sound of the uh, voice the sound of... but a hegion right. is usually translated as as uh, a um a voice that's non instrumental and again, it's the root for nigun, right? It's the same, it's the same root, it's the same Hebrew word as nigun, which is, you know, sounds don't necessarily have to have, don't necessarily have to have words behind it. So, anyways, it's a, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting concept, folks. Uh, and again, the King James, I think, actually at least has the different instruments there listed. Uh, I don't know how you get away with that, but I'm sure. People have said for a long time. So let's let's take a look, let's take a listen to some of the psalms of uh, Psalm ninety two. Some of the versions uh, I'll share with you some psalm versions um, that kind of show you the difference. But how important it is in Judaism, right, to have um, to ha to have musical versions of this. So let's take let's take a listen. This first one I'm going to do is one of my favorites. 
should probably end with this one, but I'm going to start with it because at least it has, you can hear the Hebrew on it. Well, wait, let me do, yeah, let me do this one first. This one we've actually done before. The whole world is waiting to sing this song of Shabbos. The whole wide world Actually, is waiting to sing this song of Shabbos. Yes, it's true. The whole world is waiting to sing this song of Shabbos. to do what we have to do listen to this one can't you hear the echo sing the song of Shabbos can't you hear the footsteps sing the song of Shabbos a great day is coming sing the song of Shabbos the great great Shabbos sing the song of Shabbos the whole world will be dancing Sing the song of Shabbos in Yerushalayim. Sing the song of Shabbos. So let's come back to Yerushalayim. I mean, Karlbach brought the Hasidic melodies to the forefront. I mean, in some cases, he kind of adapted it, you know, a, a Hasidic melody that no one had ever, I mean, no one in the non-Orthodox world had heard, and he brought that spirit behind it. So he, oh, he's only singing the Mizmor Shir part. I mean, I actually, he didn't even, I didn't even play the part where he, he says Mizmor Shir, but the, all he's singing is Mizmor, Mizmor Shir, Shir Leom HaShabbos, you know, Shabbos, that, that's it. Now, I want to play you, uh, this is a really interesting one, which is uh, done by reform uh, cantors. And uh, let's take a listen to this one. <laughs> So, obviously, that sounded like a Gregor Gregorian chant. The only thing is, is that the modality that they used 
somewhat based on, on that, but was actually based on what we think those psalms actually sounded like. So that psalm that you just heard, Psalm 92, sung by a choir of Jewish people, was maybe the way the psalm actually sounded 3,000 years ago. It's more likely it sounded like that. So when we hear it, we kind of think of church music, but we know that the psalms were sung by men. We know that they were sung in the temple with probably very similar type acoustics. And so that's maybe the way the psalm sounded like in the court of David 3,000 years ago. So when we hear it today, it doesn't sound, doesn't sound Jewish, but it actually might be very close. And we don't know for sure because we don't have recordings from 3,000 years ago, but we have a lot of reason to believe that that's why the way it sounded. Partly, again, based on the fact that there's parts of the Psalms that they're, and when they're sung by Gregorian in, in a Gregorian style, that we kind of separate from how the Romans would have sung music. And so part of it is peeling off the parts that, that we think were more from Rome, because again, lots of what exists in Christianity was also taken from Greco Roman culture, right? Lots of what is in Christianity was taken from Greco-Roman culture. So the issue is, if we can peel out those pieces, maybe we can figure out what are the what are the more Eastern sounds from from Israel, from from ancient Israel. So that's what that's why that psalm is such an interesting kind of like version of like maybe what that sounds like. So. Um, Again, it sounds not Jewish, but in reality, it probably is uh, close to a little bit closer to what we would have heard. Let's listen to uh, a new version of Psalm 92 sung by, and again, this is going to sound maybe not Jewish to you, but it's being sung by the Abu Yadaya, the Jews who've uh, in the last hundred years uh, converted to Judaism in Uganda. Uh, they've gone through a process of uh, being uh, trained and, and supported by, interestingly, uh, conservative and reformed Jews in the United States primarily. These are Jews who have had to go through another, in some cases, conversion when they've made Aliyah, and several of them have made Aliyah. But the Abu Yadaya, we've had a chance um, to meet some of them. We actually had a, a rabbi from the Abu Yadaya community that came to our synagogue a long time ago when he was living here and training here at the University of Judaism, Rabbi Gershom Suzumo. Uh, he's back in Uganda now, and uh, yeah, he, he's he's uh, been leading the, the synagogue for the Abu Yadaya. Um, he, he came here uh, about, I want to say, about 2010 or so. Um, and this is, I don't imagine people necessarily remember him when he came here, but um, this is uh, it's a picture of him. And so he's been helping uh, not only his community, but occasionally he'll make trips here to the United States. Uh, hold on a second. He'll make trips out here to um, help raise money for the community. Yeah, there it is. I don't know. It's not showing up here. Um, let me hold it one second. Um, there he is. So we're going to listen to um, a version of this psalm that his community, the Abu Yidaya, are singing in their synagogue in Uganda. So they've released a CD uh, a few years back, and this is what their Mizmor Shear sounds like. Give me one second. We play it, and here we go. <laughs> Abu 
So the Abu Yadaya, again, uh, there's a few thousand that are living in Uganda. And uh, I haven't been there before, but some of my friends have been there. Um, actually, somebody that you guys have met before, some of you, um, Mike Stein. He used to be a cantor at, at uh, Temple al -Yah, and his son, Jared and Justin, have been here many times. Jared and Justin went with their dad once, uh, once or twice to help the synagogue in Abu Yadaya and visit there and bring stuff to them. Uh, again, it's a really interesting story because the 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 Abu Yadaya literally converted to Judaism about 100 years ago. And um, it was a, literally one of their, one of the local kind of warlords in Uganda um, had converted to Christianity. And then he started kind of becoming interested in, in Judaism. So uh, what happened is he's read the Bible and he said, why are we not doing these things that the Bible says? So he said, we have to be circumcised. And uh, some of the Christians there said, well, we're not going to do that. He says, if you're circumcising yourself, you're a Jew. And he goes, then I'm a Jew. And he circumcised himself and declared his community was Jewish. Yeah. I don't know. I think he was uh, 40, 45. So, uh, yeah. And so they started practicing Judaism and then um, they went through kind of a really rough point in time when Uganda was controlled by Idi Amin, right? They were persecuted by Idi Amin who outlawed Jewish rituals and destroyed the synagogues. Some of them converted to Christianity and Islam and then about 300 though continued to practice Judaism. So they went through a persecution there, or a little mini anti-Semitic purge. And then in the 1980s, um, some of them uh, again started reaching out to, as Uganda emerged out of that really, really scary time of Idi Amin, um, they, uh, they started following Judaism uh, and coming back to Judaism. And interestingly, again, the uh, conservative movement supported um, them probably more than anybody. And uh, Gershom Sh Shizumu, who was the guy who came here, um, he studied at the Ziegler School at, at, uh, in Los Angeles. So, uh, so yeah, he, he was uh, ordained back in 2008. So this was about 17 years ago that he came here. Um, so, yeah, so he's there gets supported, the community is supported by the, the Jewish community, primarily here in the United States. And uh, we've done a couple of things with them on JLTV. We did a special for, for Passover for them a few years ago. Um, and the music that you just heard, again, uh, it was nominated for a Grammy Award a few years ago. But... Um, as, as you can hear, it's distinctly African yet Jewish at the same time. Many of the words combine words in Luganda, which is one of the languages in Uganda, as well as Hebrew. And psalms and prayers are set to a distinctly African tune and rhythm. So, uh, yeah, I haven't had a chance to go there, though. We talked. To, I talked about. Uh, we, we talked about doing a trip uh, a couple of years ago before COVID, 
And I don't know that that's going to be uh, something that we do soon. But yes, there are groups that got, kind of go there um, in what I would call the closest thing to a Jewish mission that we we do in the Jewish community, uh, which is supporting some communities that are, uh, you know, struggling financially and 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 in countries that are not always so safe. Uh, this is one of the only that I can think of. That's there are Jewish groups that go out. Um, Jewish World Watch, uh, the American Joint Distribution Committee, that go out to non-Jewish communities around the world that support them and help them with water supplies and with with food and with. Um, there's an organization called Cultivate out of Israel that does that does that. There's a lot of work that goes on in developing nations uh, that the, the Jewish community supports. The, the Abu Yadaya are one of the few that are actually Jewish that are being supported by the Jewish community. So it's an interesting, uh, unique thing. So just to know in the back of your mind that there are people in Africa that are um, practicing Jewish lives um, in a in a unique way and are celebrating right. Shabbat and doing all those kind of things. Yeah. Speaking about Psalms, I'm just going to this subject a little bit. Just wondering if you have anything by Jan Pierce. If what? Any if you have anything by Jan Pierce. Jan Pierce, as far as the as far as the songs. Any of the songs, yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I have songs. I mean, Canter Jan Pierce was the guy that was kind of like he he uh, he crossed over from Jewish cantorial music to. Uh, you know, popular. Um, yeah, he was on singing. Broadway also. Yeah, he was on Broadway. My and, dad and loved him. That's an just, amazing voice. And, and so my my dad used to play him a lot on, on his radio show. Yes, play Jan Pierce, and Jan Pierce was considered one of these. Again, there was a time when Jewish music and popular music really crossed over. And again, I you know, the only thing we can think of in modern days is is like Matis Yahoo, but it's a joke compared to what happened back in the '30s with with Jan Pierce. Well, the reason why I mentioned Jan Pierce is to just show what a cantor was back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the recordings of Jan Pierce are are of liturgical things like um Kol Nidre. You know, his Kol Nidre is considered like one of the most amazing. Oh, it's incredible. You know, cold injuries. And we're talking about, you know, literally this is going back, you know, years and years, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. But um, but it's 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 oftentimes the liturgy that was um you know that was done, but he but you know, he sang at Carnegie Hall, he um, you know, he you know, he uh I'll look. I'll look to see if there's any. Um, exactly. I was looking. Any you know, I was searching the internet and I couldn't find anything, any psalms that was. By yeah, I, I. It's interesting. I haven't. I'm sure there is. I, it might be. You know, it might be one that's like a, you know, a, a version of of Imesh Kechach. You know, Psalm 137. Mm. There might be something out there that that um, we can find. But it, yeah, I, I I haven't found one. I haven't found one, but it's a good one. I'll, I'll look for it to see if there's any that those that style but right. um you know psalm psalm 92 for us at least you know if you grow up where you know friday night shabbat is kind of something that you kick off it's one of the it's one of the psalms that really is identified with a time it's a, it's you know it's a it's a time of day um you know it says in the psalm itself i will praise you in the morning right and I will sing of your, you know, your faithfulness. I will, I will, you know, sing about your truth and your faithfulness in, in the nighttime. And so I think for people, that line, I mean, that, that becomes like a, that line by itself becomes a line that people know. A tov lehodot, right? Tov lehodot la Adonai. I mean, that line by itself becomes a line. So, so you know, <laughs> Karlobach singing, Karlobach singing, um, you know, Karlobach singing that line, uh, Mizmor Shir Le Yom HaShabbat, 
you know, is interesting because it's literally two. It's it's not even the lines of the psalm, right? So it's 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 a um, it's the line of um, it's the line the ascription line. It's the line that's not even you know from there. But I will tell you that I mean, like you know, for us, um, you know, for I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll actually I'll play one more piece of this one that that sticks out in my mind because it's so beautiful is um and we've actually now played it in our our, our recorded shabbats uh i mean so you know it's it's weird to think about it's weird to think about about karlbach because you know his his music during the 60s and 70s kind of i'll i'll, sh I'll just show you you know like what so I, you know, I, I didn't show you. I'll show you what it, you know. You know the stuff that he did. Sometimes it's against one line. My dearest friends, the more real it is, the harder it is to see. The deeper it is, the harder it is to see it. When you need like a revelation from God, God is to open your eyes to see it. Yerushalayim, the holy city. Yerushalayim, the holy city. It's so holy, it's so precious, it's so deep. You need God to open your eyes. So that was Karl Bach when he would sing and he would tell stories and he would, again, in some cases, just sing a line. But I'll show you, you know, that, so that was the stuff that he did, right? And now when we worked with his daughter, Nishama, when we did a Shabbat with her from New York last year, you know, part of it was what she does, which is very different than her father, but of course, you know, she's known because of her father. And, and so she has a, a version of, of this, of this Psalm of Psalm 92. I'll just share you a little bit uh, on video, but this is, uh, this is Neshama. That day we'll see and each other's eyes. Hold on a second. So in a lot of ways, obviously, it's doing a kind of a more modern version, a more rock version. That's her, actually her son. That's Carla Bach's grandson playing guitar right there. <laughs> so he's much more interested in playing guitar than than singing or singing uh, Jewish songs. Uh, I mean, he does sing Jewish songs, but he's very interested in playing guitar. According to Nishama, he'd much he'd he'd be he'd he'd more like I think she said something to he'd really like to be like John Mayer. I mean, I'd really like him to be like Shlomo Karlebach, but he wants to be like John Mayer. But uh, he's a great guitar player, which is very funny because Karlebach knew two chords on the guitar. He would strum the guitar, and he didn't. And everyone would laugh because not laugh; they would recognize that he didn't play guitar. His grandson loves to play guitar, and uh, and but Karlebach's amazing ability to to take lines from the Torah, whether it's again Mizmor Shir or Tov Hadot. Um, and just you know, again, putting it to music and and making people uh, feel good with the, with the with maybe two words, maybe two words. Um, the words tov lehodot, right? It is good to sing praises. It's good to sing. It's good to be. It's good to. It's good to. I mean, look, the the word hodot literally means to praise God. Okay, but you can see from the context of. It's clearly about singing, right? It's praising God through song. So if you say the words over and over again, those three lines, 
even if those are like the only three lines of the song, when you say Tov Le Dot Ladonai, how good it is to sing to God, what more do you need to say than Tov Le Dot Ladonai? You really don't need to say anything more than that. So the fact that these Hasidic melodies, in some cases, only have a few words, it's not, it's not like, what more do you have to say? Like everything else is embellishing and, and building on this amazing idea. It's just good to sing. It's good to praise God through song. It's great to, to just be happy through music, right? And so that's what the Hasidic melodies did. And that's what Karlobach did by teaching them to a non-Hasidic group. Uh, and then again, what his daughter's doing by trying to continue that tradition. So um, again, it's just a strange thing that for us, sometimes a song is three words. Um, yeah, it's a powerful psalm for a lot of reasons, but it's almost it's it's simplicity over six sixteen lines, but in some cases again over over just those lines. Now, Psalm ninety three doesn't um, doesn't have any ascription. It's also considered a psalm for Shabbat, but in some ways, it's almost again like it's different from the last psalm, but. Some people would say it's almost like a continuation of the previous psalm in that, again, there's no ascription. There's no, there's no, um, hey, this psalm is, there, there's a new psalm starting here, but um, <clears throat> there's no title, there's no author. Um, and let's take a look at Psalm 93, which, as I said, is also used for um Kabbalat Shabbat. Let's take a look. Judith? Uh, the Lord is king. He is robed in grandeur. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. The world stands firm. It cannot be shaken. Your throne stands firm from of old. From eternity you have existed. The ocean sounds Oh Lord, the ocean sounds its thunder, the ocean sounds its pounding. Above the thunder of the mighty waters, more majestic than the breakers of the sea, is the Lord, majestic on high. Your decrees are indeed enduring. Holiness befits your house, O oh Lord, for all times. Mm -hmm. So you can see you heard the sea pounding last night. You did? You heard it, huh? Yeah, we had yeah. bad winds yesterday. It was loud. Yeah. Definitely has a, a feeling like, again, using using uh using the uh, the the oceans or the waters it could also be the waters. Um the King James translation is not even like that. I was like the floods, right? Mary, the floods. I'm not sure if Naha wrote, you know, it could also Mary, be waters. Floods? Yeah. No, that's the word for Naha wrote, for oceans. What does your translation say? The ocean, right? So flood seems like it's water out of control. I mean, to me at least. Um, but again, it, God is mightier than that, right? God is is stronger than this. It's a very short psalm, right? This is five verses, but um, but it's not part of the previous psalm. I mean, it, it's not. I mean, it's not like it, they cut off the psalm and then, oh, well, maybe this is part of part of that as well. Uh, interestingly, um, one of the things that in Jewish in Jewish tradition, I don't know, I don't know. You, you can decide whether or not this uh, appears to be uh, part of um, you. Well, it will, I'll, it's only five verses, right? But um, it seems to be a lot about the waters, right? It seems like maybe this is a good one to use when you're on a cruise or something, when the waters are really bad or something. I don't know. But no, interestingly, this one... <laughs> This one is considered in Jewish tradition a psalm that you're supposed to say when you go to court. Probably from this line, your decrees are indeed enduring. 
holiness befits your house. So your your judgments, I don't know, what does the King James say? Does it have your decrees? Yeah, your testimonies, which sounds more court-like. Yeah, the adotecha, those are the testimonies, the adot, the adot, you know, the like the ed, to be a witness. So the testimonies, um, so yeah, it was considered to be for good luck in court cases. <laughs> it shows you that even back in those days, people were litigious. So um, yeah, this is a psalm that, again, seems to me to be a good one for calming the seas, calming the waters, but it's a translation. Uh, not a lot of versions of this uh, that I know of that have been done. Karlbach did a version of... of uh, the last line uh, of version, but again, not not as not nearly as much as Psalm ninety two, but yeah, it's also part of the Psalms for Shabbat. The weird thing is this Shabbat, this uh, Psalm is not a Shabbat Psalm, ninety two, ninety three, and then ninety five through ninety nine. So almost like saying, "Don't bring me ninety four on Shabbat." You almost picked it out. <laughs> don't do this one on Shabbat. I don't really know why. I mean, you know. We'll, we'll get into some of the other Psalms and the 90, I don't know if we'll go all the way through 95 to 99, but yeah, you do, we do Psalm 92, 93, 95 through 99, but not Psalm 94. Don't do, don't do Psalm 94 on Shabbat. I don't know. I mean, I, uh, you know, this is, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why it can't be part of the Psalms of Shabbat, but it's not. There is a tradition, as we talked about, um, to do psalms on other days of the week. There's a psalm for today, right? We looked at Psalm 80, 82, the psalm of Tuesdays. There's a psalm Wednesday, etc. But the psalms of Shabbat, Psalm 92 says a psalm of Shabbat. But Psalm 90, <clears throat> 92 through 99, with the exception of this psalm, are psalms of Shabbat. This psalm also has no ascription. So as he said, you know, Three quarters of the Psalms have, have ascriptions, some don't. 93 didn't, and neither does this one, 94. Let's take a look at Psalm 94. Judith, you still there? I might have lost Judith. Sorry, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. God of retribution, Lord, God of retribution, appear. Rise up, judge of the earth. Give the arrogant their desserts. Spell wrong. How long <laughs> shall... I'll give them their desserts. I, mean, that's tra- I don't know what's your translation of verse two, Mary. Give them their just desserts is what I'm I know. Thinking. What's your translation, Mary? Render a word to the proud is the King James. Ge'im are usually the, the proud or the arrogant, but it's the gemul. It's the gemul that's the... Uh, the dessert or the desert, the, the final thing. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked, O oh Lord, how long shall the wicked exult? Shall they utter insolent speech? Shall all evildoers vaunt themselves? They crush your people, O oh Lord. They afflict your very own. They kill the widow and the stranger. They murder the fatherless thinking the Lord does not see it, the God of Jacob does not pay heed. Take heed, you most brutish people. Fools, when will you get wisdom? Shall he who implants the ear not hear? He who forms the eye not see? Shall he who disciplines nations not punish? He who instructs men in knowledge? The Lord knows the designs of men to be futile. Happy is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, the man you instruct in your teaching, to give him tranquility in times of misfortune until a pit be dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his very own. Judgment shall again accord with justice and all the upright shall rally to it. Who will take my part against evil men? Who will stand up for me against wrongdoers? Were not the Lord my help? I should soon dwell in silence. When I think my foot has given way, your faithfulness, O Lord, supports me. When I am filled with cares, your assurance soothes my soul. 
Shall the seat of injustice be your partner by, that frames mischief by statute? They band together to do away with the righteous. They condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord is my haven. My God is my sheltering rock. He will make their evil recoil upon them, annihilate them through their own wickedness. The Lord, our God, will annihilate them. Yeah. So well, it's obvious why it's not <laughs> it's, Shabbat. Yes, not a Shabbat Man. song. Not a Shabbat <laughs> song. Look, there's not there's parts of this about, you know, again, God being our help, our salvation, our, you know, happy, you know, uh, you know, uh think about God's, you know, the God's miracles, right? God makes the ear, right? He makes the ear and the eye, right? Of course, God knows what's going on. He actually gives us the power to see and to hear. He's the one who created this amazing body that we have. Of course, God hears. Um, but yes, it's uh, it's a it's a it's a psalm of justice, right? It's a psalm of God wreaking revenge on those who are not doing the right thing, right? So this psalm, you know, calls attention to the fact that people are oppressing the almanah, the ger, the yatom. Those are the most vulnerable in, society, in the biblical society, right? The widow, the stranger, and the fatherless. Usually it's the ger almanah, the yatom. Here it's almanah, the ger, the yatom. But throughout the book of Deuteronomy, I'm just thinking about it because it's in the book of Deuteronomy over and over and over again, right? The ger almanah, the yatom, you know, the, the stranger, the, the, <clears throat> the widow, and the, and the, and the orphan. Um, yeah, these are, I mean, there's nobody worse than that who takes advantage of that. I mean, in this case, they're murdering them. Uh, and they think they can get away with it. You know, that's the, the key is that these people think that they can get away with it. So we, um, we have this psalm, which again, similar to other psalms that we've heard about God vindicating and fixing the situation that doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, it's not going the right way, but it will. God will eventually deal justice to these people, right? But there also is this understanding this, um, you know, isn't some of the obligation back on us, right? Because when the, the psalmist says, who will take my part against evil men? Who will stand against me against wrongdoers? Were not the Lord my help, I shall dwell in silence, right? If, if it wasn't for God, I'd die because no one else is doing it. Which seems to imply, at least I think pretty strongly, folks, that it's our job to stop this. If we don't, then hopefully God will at some point. But isn't it our job to do it? Yeah, John. It sounded very childlike to me is when President Bush said in during 9 11. Right? I don't remember what the. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if this is the song he was referencing. Well, so John says when when George Bush was, were, were used the word evildoers, it sounded childish, and uh, and so John's wondering, is this the song? But I will tell you, it's there a lot in the Bible, and so when when Bush quotes it, he probably is quoting biblical scripture that he was, you know, steeped in. Again, the interesting thing about George. Junior George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush versus H. W. is George Senior was not very religious. I don't mean that he wasn't a believing person. I'm sure he, you know, he went to church and stuff like that. But it was it was George W. that was much more, you know, he had gone through a, a a religious, you know, conversion, if you will. He was born again, which was not something that his father, who was steeped in, you know, high Anglican church, Episcopal church type style of, of you know, Yale University, Kennebunkport, 
style was not his thing. But I think, you know, John, you're, you're right. If, if somebody is influenced by, you know, Bible study and by the, the ministries that he's a part of, yeah, he probably did affect him. And I, I think it probably brought him into using some of those terms that he, that he was exposed to in the Bible. Because of that, and the attacks were done in the name of religion to a certain extent, right? His, his statement to those who also reference, because the Quran references the Psalms, right? Or whatever, per se, that he's making a point directly. That, Listen, I understand what you did, I understand what I'm saying, and we're referencing the same reference book. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the Quran. I'm not sure if the Quran uses that. It could. Maybe when it's translated into Arabic, there's a yeah. It could be that there's a that there's an Arabic. Like they hear that and they, they understand that they're on the wrong side. Um, I see you. You see me. Let's go. Could be. Could be. No, it could. It it could be. It could be. But I. I your point is, is that when you heard it, it sounded like he was talking childishly, and you realize now that it's biblical language. Yeah, yeah, it's it is. Uh, it definitely affected his his uh, words, his uh, his connection to the Bible. Definitely affected his words more than it did. I mean, again, other presidents too, but you know. In in contrast to his father, it's an interesting it was an interesting situation because you know I do believe he had a much different you know look the reality is is that Ronald Reagan and George Bush Senior represented the old guard of the Republican Party which had embraced evangelical Christianity but was not neither of those guys were of evangelical Christianity George W Bush was of evangelical Christianity. I mean, I mean it, it, you have to step back for a second. I mean, it's a good point because we just commemorated 9-11 last week that George Bush sounded like he was from Texas. He was not from Texas. I mean, there was there has to be a point in his life. I mean, he grew up, you know, he, his father was in the oil business too. It's not like he wasn't exposed to Texas. But did he talk like that when he was at Yale? I mean, maybe. Maybe he did. I don't... It doesn't seem like he did. He talked a whole lot different than his dad did. That that I know. So it's an interesting thing when you think about how different they were and, and when it came to their values and it came to the kind of their 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 the way they saw the world. I There's no question that George W. Bush saw it in a biblical fashion. I don't think his father did. For better or worse. I mean, I think, you know, George W. Bush had a had a very clear cut. Hey, this is the wrong side, and this is the right side. And and George Senior had a much more nuanced, you know, I work in the CIA, you know, type of look, which is it's all gray. It's all gray, right? It's the gray. Using language that my enemy understands. That's all. Could be, but I also think you're right in that he was exposed to evangelical language, and I think biblical language in a way that his father wasn't. Again, the no, I, I, I know, I know, but he did it other times too. When he was speaking off the cuff, he would talk. People would say, "Gosh, he sounds like a preacher a little bit," and his dad did not. And it's interesting because again, you think you know the father's more religious than the son. It was not the you know it's not always the case. All right, now Psalm 95, we get back to Shabbat. And now we don't only get back to Shabbat, but arguably this line is a line that uh, maybe is the most famous part of Kabbalah Shabbat with the exception of Lacha Dodi. And that is a Lachu. Lacha is come let us uh, greet Shabbat. Lacha Dodi, let's greet the bride, right? This is Lachu. Let's go, let's go out and sing joyously to the Lord. Again, no ascription, but the words lehunaranana are some of the most famous lines of Shabbat songs. And again, Wendy just wrote a version of lehunaranana. There are a lot of versions of lehunaranana. 
Psalm 95, let's take a look at why Lechuna Ranana, again, does not begin with a Mizmor Shir Leoma Shabbat, doesn't say this is for Shabbat, but Psalm 95 is, again, along with Psalm 92 and along with Lechadadi are the, the most famous lines of Shabbat. Let's take a look at Lechuna Ranana. Judith, are you there? Second. I don't see her on. She might have left. She had. She did have. Yep, she's got to go. So, um, Lachuna Ranana, this is the Psalm, um, Psalm 95. Come, let us sing joyously to the Lord. Raise a shout for our rock and deliverer. Let us come into his presence with praise. Let us raise a shout for him in song. For the Lord is a great God, the great King of all divine beings. In his hands are the depth of the earth. The peaks of the mountain are his. His is the sea. He made it and the land which his hands fashioned. Come, let us bow down and kneel. Bend the knee before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people he tends, the flock in his care. Oh, if you would but heed his charge this day. Do not be stubborn as at Meribah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test tried me, though they had seen my deeds. Forty years I was provoked by that generation. I thought, they are a senseless people. They would not know my ways. Concerning them, I swore in anger, they shall never come to my resting place. Now, uh, the last part of the psalm is God having flashbacks of the wilderness. Of all the times that the people complain, where's our water? Where's our food? Where's our... And so that's not a, the good part of the psalm. The psalm picks out with a beautiful praise of God, right? A beautiful praise of God. God controls everything. All of the world is in God's power. And then it changed right here, right? Uh, in verse 8, it shifts to, don't be like those people. But the first part of the psalm really has that celebration and that feeling that we had from Psalm 92, which is how good it is to sing. Let us sing. Let us praise. Lechuna ranana. Um, na'ira. Na'ira is to raise a shout or to, to celebrate with, loud no, with a loud noise. Um, this, is, this is a psalm. And, and again, um, this is a, this is a, another example of people focus like all you almost have to do is go to the first line right you almost only have to go to the lacuna ranana part to say oh that's good isn't that good i mean let's just do that let's just do lacuna ranana so this is um a lot of versions of lacuna ranana but um we'll put this one on that you might know or versions versions of lacuna ranana hold it one second um, this is a very cantorial one albert mizrahi So that's one of the, the 
cantorial, um, you know, flourish, flourishy ones. Um, let's see about this one. Totally different. So you can see there, that's more of the Hasidic, uh, you know, the more of the kind of the upbeat um, versions of Lachuna Ranana that people sing. But again, generally generally speaking, they're singing, you know, two or three um, uh, lines. In most cases, just two lines. Lachuna Ranana. Uh, here's Let another. Let us Lachuna. sing unto God. Sing unto God a new song. This is Alana Arian, who's a very Let contemporary. Us sing like unto the last God. five years. Sing unto God a new So you can see that's literally singing one verse, you know. Um, and again, that's what people have been doing for thousands of years. So, um, but again, you know, the two verses clearly go together, right? Come, let us sing a, a joy uh, joyously to the Lord, paralleled with the next line, let us come into his presence with praise. And again, let us raise a, or Naria Litsuri Sheni, right? Let's shout, right? Raise a shout or sing loudly to our rock and our deliverer is praised with, let us raise a shout for him. He wrote Naria Lo. Same word, Naria, Naria. Uh, and here is, um, again, you know, the, the, the structure where you can see that the verse builds on the, on the, uh, on the previous verse. But again, you know, some people don't sing the Nikad Ma Fanav I mean, so the most common version of Lakuna Ranana, the one that, you know, kind of people grew up singing is Lakuna Ranana, Lakuna Ranana, Lakuna Rana, you know, it's the Nariya, Nariya, Litsur Yishani, Nikta Ma Fanav, you know, that's Nariya, Nariya, Litsur Yishani. So, um, Again, sometimes it's just two lines of the psalm that people sing over and over again. And, and again, in the in the case of where Christians are singing the psalm, it's the same thing. I mean, they oftentimes will just sing a couple lines. There's only eleven lines in the in the psalm, but really, if you look at the rest of the psalm from Psalm eight from verse eight on, it's not stuff that you necessarily want to sing. Right? Don't be like our ancestors who were a senseless people who didn't pay attention to God and complained all the time. I mean, you're not going to put that to music. But the first couple of lines are gorgeous. So they're beautiful. They're celebratory. They're, 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 they, they remind us that we bring to God this energy and, and we celebrate. You know, we, Shabbat is about celebrating. So that's the, the interesting thing about Psalm 95. Again, as we saw from Psalm 92, sometimes just a couple of verses. And that's, and that's what makes it into the, the, uh, the song. Or again, the musical adaptation of it. If you can, you know, you can do the whole song. You can sing the whole song. It's only 11 verses. 
So we're going to uh, definitely read this next psalm, which is one of my favorites and one of the ones that you also know. You've heard versions of Psalm 96 before. It's also a psalm of Shabbat. But what's interesting about this psalm, at least for um, people in, in uh, other traditions, and, and I think, like, you know, I think I, I, uh, I, will, I will tell you that um, um, both Jews and Christians uh, love versions of this, of this psalm because uh, to some extent, it like summarizes lots of what we've read before. But I think what, what this psalm does is it invites people to, in every generation, to sing. Every generation, somebody decides in almost every year, I hear a new version of this. Shiru Adonai, Shir Chadash, Shiru Adonai, Kol Haaretz. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim his victory day after day. Tell of his glorious, tell of his glory among the nations, his wondrous deeds among all peoples. For the Lord is great and much acclaimed. He is held in awe by all divine beings. All the gods of the peoples are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and majesty are before him. Strength and splendor are in his temple. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring tribute and enter his courts. Bow down to the Lord, majestic in holiness. Tremble in his presence, all the earth. Declare among the nations, the Lord is king. The world stands firm, it cannot be shaken. He judges the people with equity. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth exult. Let the sea and all within it thunder. The fields and everything in them. Then shall all the trees of the forest shout for joy. At his presence, at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to rule the earth. He will rule the world justly and its people in faithfulness. Now, it's hard to know where to begin with this psalm because Nefesh Mountain, how did you know that? <laughs> Absolutely, right? So, so you understand now, Psalm 96 begins with one of the most famous lines that, again, it, it invites people just to continuously compose music. Shir Ladonai, Shir Chadash. Sing to God, sing a new song. Now, think about this. This was written 3,000 years ago. Somebody said, I'm going to sing a new song. And then this was the song. And then every generation, people have said, I'm going to sing a new song. And I'm going to sing those words, Shir Ladonai, Shir Chadash. I'm going to sing a new melody. I'm going to put this to a new melody. I'm going to sing this in, in, a, in a totally new way. And so it invites people to sing the Psalms. It invites people to bring a fresh approach to the Psalms and to singing and to praising God with songs. Right? I will proclaim his, his victory. I will proclaim God's salvation and God's saving, right, every day. Um, but again, this psalm also reminds us that all the world is, is celebrating. And again, there's an interesting universality, universality to this too, right, that all the peoples will sing to God. Now, what's interesting is that we actually use so much of this psalm that we, it's not like we use the whole psalm necessarily. In, in some cases, we're just using a few verses, like this, this part we use all the time. amim, right? When we take out the Torah, we have a we have a, a, tra a tradition of 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 bringing out the Torah, and we and when we bring out the Torah, we actually are saying to the whole world these words. So we sing when we come out with the Torah. We sing. Yeah, and and 
And this line, kodesh, we actually say those words, bow down to the Lord majestic in holiness. So there's this idea that when we bring out the Torah, we're not just bringing it out to Jews, we're bringing it out to everybody. Declare among the nations the Lord is king. So this, this is not just for us. It's not just for Jews. It's for the whole world, right? It's saying all the other gods are just idols. They're not, they're not real. And it says he's held in awe by all divine beings. That's the line where you can also translate it as he's held in awe by all the Elohim, all ko Elohim. That's the word that's used there. So we can translate it as angels, but it can also be translated, again, or divine beings. It can also be translated as God is the God of all gods. All the gods of the people are mere idols. They're just idols. Um, so there's this idea that, again, this is a proclamation of God's greatness in the whole world, especially at a time when other people worshipped idols, and they worshipped other gods. But, as Mary pointed out, we love this line. And this line, just by itself, I mean, Psalm 96, Shiru Ladonai, we've had versions, I'll play you some versions of Shiru Ladonai, we just sang another one, I think last week, Rick and Addy uh, opened with Shiro Lado and I don't even, didn't even tell them that that's what we were going to read. But line 11, Yismechu HaShamayim, the Tagel HaAretz. The traditional, you know, Yismechu HaShamayim, Yismechu HaShamayim, HaShamayim. But when we think about the versions of this psalm that we love and that we celebrate the earth with, right? We can think of some of the ways that we sing this today. And some of the ways that, again, one of them that Mary just pointed out, one of the ones that when I heard it, I kind of fell in love with it and wanted to share it with everybody else, um, is a version that we incorporate into our virtual versions of it. And it is this one, my friends. I will bring it up for y'all. Even though these people are from New Jersey, they're not from the South. Let's listen. Hmm, where did the sound go? Uh, we're not getting sound in here. We're not getting sound here either. Well, I gotta, we got to get the sound off there. Hold it a second. As soon as I made it big, it sounded. Oh, like it. Ways you got it now? Is that the sound? Yeah. We're all given time. Let's get the use of Yep. 
So there you got to hear a little Yismechu Hashamayim, where you can see why they did it on a beautiful mountain with, again, a sense of a sense of recognition of how beautiful the world is. And the fact that the earth and look at the heavens, they showed the sky, you know, uh, the every part of the, of our world, right? The, the, the Bible splits the world up into three living spaces, the earth, the land, right? The sea and the, and the heavens. And so they're all used here. Hashemayim, the Haaretz, and the Yam. And so those three worlds are all are all uh, are all celebrating. It's not just human beings that celebrate God, it's the it's the world, it's the different the different spheres of of existence, of life, you know, that that, that the whole world is uh, celebrating. So that line becomes one of the lines that we kind of take out on Shabbat and sing different versions of Yismechu. Um, but again, the line captures all three of those of those spaces. It's such a beautiful line. Uh, but again, you know, you can go back, as I said, how many, the, the Havu parts are the parts that a little bit more about God's majesty and the God's you know, power as, as like a ruler. But the other parts, as we said, is the Shir Ladonai Shir Chadash. So what's what's so interesting about that the about the phrase Shir Chadash is that there are synagogues that are named Shir Chadash. Actually, uh, Judith's cousin is a rabbi at Shir Chadash, or she just retired, Shir Chadash up in uh, San Jose uh, area. Um, but it's just such a... a, a a beautiful phrase, right? Shir Chadash by itself is a beautiful phrase. So I'll play you a couple. We'll go out today listening to uh, another version of, of Shir Chadash. Or, um, I'm going to play, um, gosh, I wonder what happened to this guy. This guy kind of disappeared a little bit, but I'm going to play you. This is a, a more uh, traditional kind of... So Ozzy Schwartz in in uh, New York at uh, Park Avenue Synagogue in, in New York is considered one of the best cantors in the world. So if you look at yeah, my cousin, Schwartz, what my cousin is what Ozzy Schwartz. Oh, because he's part of the Schwartz the Schwartz dynasty. Uh, yes, yeah, the clans. I don't know. You yeah, you can claim him. I'm sure he'll like that. Uh, but that's so he does, you know, more contemporary. But he also does very kind of uh cantorial flourish this is a guy i don't know what happened to him he he was writing jewish music uh, a few years ago maybe about 10 15 years ago every day when you wake up in the morning and you think you are the only one in every time that one piece fills you with the courage and strength to do Sing, sing this song To the love of any song She will shear, shear, shear la She will shear, shear, call her She will shear, Yeah, people were singing his songs at camps a lot. I don't know what happened to him, but here's another <laughs> This is Jewish Acapella, 613. 613. They like the 
So a few years back when Glee was big and acapella was big, uh, 613 was one of like three or four really like they were doing stuff all around the country. The Maccabees were the biggest. They were, also came out with a lot of cool videos, the Maccabees. But 613 was another one. There's another one, too. I'm forgetting the name of right now. That was a pretty big Jewish acapella one, too. But they were all like they were big like 10 years ago. Uh, seven eight years ago, up till about that time, they were they were it was just a hot thing. It was and they were they were Orthodox guys. Uh, all these all these uh, groups. So um, yeah, but Shir Hadash is such a great it's such a great uh, phrase. It's something that if you think about the fact that for thousands of years the Jewish people said, we're not just going to sing. We're not going to sing to God. You know, a song that was handed down to us. We're going to take the songs that are handed down to us, and we're going to give them new melodies. We're going to give them modern melodies. We're going to make them alive. And again, it wasn't just Jews that did that. I mean, it's obviously churches and, and different groups. Anyone who saw those words were inspired by it. But again, to think about the fact that these are words from our people that were shared thousands of years ago and are still being said in a way to inspire people. It's not just, hey, let's sing a song. Let's sing a song that versions of it you know the words maybe are the ba are the basis for the words are thousands of years old but we're going to give them new life it's that it's that the people who are continuously grounded in tradition but looking forward is the is the secret you know to to jewish survival is to use the tradition but also incorporate it into into modern ways and so that's something that we've never been afraid of doing shouldn't be afraid of doing it and again, even though the you know it's you see it a little less in the Orthodox world, but six thirteen are Orthodox Jews. I mean, these are guys who clearly were inspired by what Glee was doing. I mean, I, you know, they were studying Torah, but they were also inspired by the musical styles that were popular a few years ago. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how they sing it in the future. <laughs> what will the sounds be like in the future? But there will be psalm versions of it, and there will be uh, new songs that will be sung in the future. Uh, and I love the fact that, again, one of the things I love about Nefesh Mountain and Joe Buchanan is that they're using traditional American sounds and bringing them to, um, they're bringing them to uh, Jewish, traditional Jewish uh, phrasing and texts, and obviously using the Hebrew in those songs, which to me is, is, is amazing. As, as, as you all learned uh, a few months ago, uh, I have a banjo in my house. I mean, just, just think about, consider that for a second. Consider how weird that is. Um, but now I love Americana. I love uh, roots music and I love that sound. So somewhere in, in my back, in my maybe a previous life, I was a hillbilly. Anyways, take care everybody and we'll see you hopefully to, uh, tomorrow night. It not, we do not have Wednesday night class. We have these uh, very special speakers who are going to be here. They're going to speak at Stephen S. Weiss. Then they're going up to Santa Barbara to speak. We're doing an interview with them uh, on JLTV, which will at least preserve this. But again, I have no idea exactly. I listen, we ne I never know for sure what a speaker is going to say when they're going to be here. But uh, we're, we're again, in, in, hopefully you can come here tomorrow night and uh, bring people. We are working on a, I told you, we're working on a Nova visit, but it's only uh, six more weeks here. But when I, when I told them that we're bringing 20 people, they said, just book it through the normal thing. They were like, unless you're, you don't need to worry about booking it as a group. But I told them I wanted to book it as a group and they, they don't, it didn't seem to be that high of a priority, but we'll figure it out. I, mean, I, I might just buy the tickets through them and then, and then open it up to people. And if people don't, if we don't sell all the tickets, God, you know, so what? There's a donation to the Nova uh, group that, again, they're taking this on the road. And so after, it's here through October 7th, and then uh, October 8th, it's moving on. I have a feeling that October 7th is going to be pretty hard to go to on that day. But, um, but I'll, I'll, you know, I might buy a block of, you know, 10 or 15, 20 tickets. And then again, if people don't, use it it's a donation so we'll let people know but they they didn't seem to be that eager to have us go as a block group all right folks i will um we will talk to you soon and again hopefully see you over the next couple of days if not then and you'll be there friday night or the next friday night take care everybody i'll see you soon bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.